from Vancouver Island University in the biology department. Um, and I'm also here representing NS3, which is the Nanaimo Science and Sustainability Society. I'm really excited to um, present a project, a citizen science project that I've been helping develop in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. And uh, I'm also even more excited about making some connections with people here that all have the same goal, connecting science and education. Um, so I probably don't ha need to define citizen science to the group. Um, you guys are all aware of uh, the need for things like this. But I'm just going to start with a working definition, which is basically the public participation in scientific research. Um, there's a few different uh, models of this citizen science, and the one I'm going to focus on is the one that's the most common, and that's uh, public contribution to data collection. Um, it's not a new concept, citizen science. Anyone that's participated in the uh, Christmas bird count knows that it goes back to the early 1900s. But there's definitely been an enormous increase in citizen science projects worldwide. And this has to do with um, changes in information and communication technology. From a science perspective, this is due to, um, I'm supposed to keep myself on track for timing. <laughs> and from a science perspective, this um, has to do with uh, efficient data collection. Enormous amounts of data can be collected um, using these new changes in uh, technology. And with that comes a lot of um, um, non-random data, so there's actually a lot of programs now that can help with the uh, processing and analysis of these large data sets. So th those are the reasons that spearheaded some of these citizen science projects, but the technology is also making this easy and accessible for the average Joe to do. Um, I can turn my iPhone into a bat detector and take my dog for a walk and be collecting data that is um, instantly accessible to researchers. So the accessibility, I think, is enormous as well. Um, visualization of the data, I mean, we've, we've been looking at different ways to visualize data um, this morning alone in, in the first session, and that is an enormous uh, contributor to the popularity of citizen science. This causes an immediate engagement with people with the project itself, and it also provides a platform. People want to do things. They are recognizing that there's problems in the world today with our environment, with our oceans, and they need a platform to contribute. And this is an easy and accessible way. It's a, it's a means for collective action. Um, so citizen science, a lot of people are recognizing its importance for contributing to um, science uh, publications and research and information, but it's also an enormous um, it's an, it has enormous potential for learning for the participants as well as the scientific researchers as well. Um, you know, at a time when education researchers are starting to look at authentic learning, uh, contextual learning, personal learning, um, inquiry-based learning that we talked about this morning, citizen science is naturally providing all of these characteristics. But there's a lot of new citizen science projects that are being developed that don't actually cultivate this educational um, experience for the participants. Um, so what, coming from a long line of educators, one of my first um, instincts is to say, OK, how can we take this incredible experience of participating in authentic scientific research and connect it to a formal science education? Um, so, we know, and education researchers are starting, as well as actually funding agencies, are starting to recognize that we're learning about science, um, a small percentage of what we're learning about science and the environment and, and the ocean is not occurring in the formal school system. It's occurring outside of the classroom, it's occurring out in the environment, and this is what we refer to as informal learning. And um, I see citizen science as a way to connect the two, to, to bridge the two. Um, there's actually been research that's shown that citizen science, participating in citizen science projects can improve the participant's scientific literacy. Um, it can improve specific science skills and it can also increase engagement and interest in science. And although most of this research is done in terrestrial environments, um, I, I do believe that this can be, um, can be done in the, in the ocean as well. But one thing that a lot of people are, are most interested in, and most people in this, this room are probably interested in, is the research that's indicating that participation in citizen science can actually change people's attitudes, their values, their behavior towards the environment that they're working in. Um, so this is what we're trying to strive for ultimately is earth and ocean stewardship. And I, I truly believe that combining the two is actually um, can lead towards this. And as a couple people have mentioned that we need to assess this and prove it as well. 
Um, so with that very, very brief introduction of citizen science, I'm going to explain and introduce a project that I've been helping develop on Vancouver Island. I'm going to present it in a very um, logical, step-by-step -step manner, but I have to admit that there is nothing linear about this that is occurring at all. So it might, this might be the way I had imagined it might occur, um, but it is changing constantly. So when you develop a citizen science project, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that some people of you are already involved in a citizen science project, or you might be considering it or looking at it as a possible way to bridge, um, improve ocean literacy and bridge um, the, the two, two areas of science and education. So um, this, these are, my steps are based on um, a book, a recent publication by um, Dickinson and Bonnie, who are experts on citizen science. And um, it's called Citizen Science, Public Participation in Environmental, uh, in env environmental Monitoring. Um, so they suggest cho first choosing a scientific question. And they highlight, as well as other researchers, that it's extremely important to have um, an authentic engagement of researchers. You can't just create uh, a citizen science project that doesn't have um, interest in publishing the results and finding out scientific information. So with that, I'm going to bring the main player of our citizen science research project um, forth. We, we are um, looking at the varnished clam. So the varnished clam was, um, is native to Asia, so Japan, Korea, and China. And it was first reported in the uh, Northeast Pacific in 1991. It was thought to have arrived, arrived here in ballast water of um, shipping vessels right here in Vancouver Harbor. Um, the range has been shocking at how quickly this, this organism has spread along with the currents both north and south. It's continually expanding. And Dr. Sarah Dudas um, actually did her PhD thesis on the invasion dynamics of the varnish clam, published in 2005. And although um, her thesis um, didn't identify any immediate concerns about it out competing any native species, she did highlight the need to continue long-term monitoring of this Varnish clam because it was having some um, impacts um, on, on unsuspected areas. It, it um, ha inhabits the high intertidal area, so they were seeing raccoons foraging on it. So there could be a link between the terrestrial environments and the aquatic environment. Um, also, there was birds like the um, the oyster catcher that was feeding on it. That their populations were actually uh, looking like they might be increasing as a result. So um, we decided our main question was going to be, what is the distribution, size, and abundance of bivalves on Vancouver Island <clears throat> beaches over time, beginning at Nanaimo? So this was an authentic research question that we had that, that would be looked at and published eventually. And then we needed to form a project team. And as you can see from all of the talks this morning, interdisciplinarity is essential. Um, so we started with uh, Liz DiMaccia. Dr. Liz DiMaccia is the executive director of an NGO called the Nanaimo Science and Sustainability Society. And she was the brainchild of this whole program. Um, she was a sessional instructor at Vancouver Island University, and she wanted to bring this concept and have her students, the conservation biology class, develop a citizen science project. Not knowing where it would go, not having any funding at all, but giving each of the students a piece of it to help develop whatever their personal interest was in, was in it. And it actually took off. She, um, consulted Dr. Sarah Dudas, the expert on the varnish clam, uh, as well as Dr. Jane Watson, who, if you don't know her name, she's a brilliant ecologist as well as an educator. Um, myself, I came on board right from the start because I've volunteered at NS3. Um, I work in the biology department at Vancouver Island University, and I'm doing my doctorate in education at University of Calgary with a focus on education technology and hopefully citizen science. Um, and we also had a school, Departure Bay School, which was slated to be closed and the teachers and the principals got together and they decided that they were going to turn themselves into an eco-academy school focusing on the environment around them and they were a block away from the beach, one of our key um, sites. So we worked closely with the educators there, the principal, the teachers, as well as the administration. And, and like I said, this is not a linear process. Our team is evolving as we go along. So next we had to, although this is step three in... Um, how to begin a citizen science project, the recipe. Uh, we definitely did not develop our education goals right from the start. So the reason I'm putting it so early on because I think it's essential that as a team you sit down and decide what are our scientific goals as well as what are our education goals. And that was one of the main reasons that I was brought on because I, I identified that there were some problems in our goal setting. Um, 
Dickinson and Bonnie highlight that the, although the scientific goals and the educational goals will be complementary, um, there are going to be trade-offs. So that's why it's good to come up with your goals ahead of time. So our scientific goals were, as I defined earlier, our question. The biggest thing was accuracy. Uh, we identified as a group that our target uh, would be grade fives. And there's a, a long list of reasons why that happened, and I won't go into it. But I do think it's really important to highlight what your target group is. You're not going to reach everyone. So it's best to identify what your goals are for that. Um, our educational goals, like I said, are still a little bit evolving, but the main thing was having these grade five students participate in scientific, authentic scientific inquiry. Um, and I've highlighted why that's so important. And also we wanted to connect it to formal curriculum. We wanted to connect with the school, the school board because that's a, an audience that we felt was needing um, a little bit of help because the new B, uh, provincial curriculum guidelines were coming out and there was definitely not a lot of guidance on how to go about it. There was no description of including the environment in any of the science education for the grades we were looking at. So we felt like we should be going to the schools and working with them. And we also wanted to tap into that um, behavioral uh, and value system and, and changes. So we wanted to make the students, hopefully uh, have the students become aware of their impact on the ocean. And this is one of the reasons why I'm here today, is I wanted to tie into existing systems like ocean literacy that's been developed elsewhere and try and tie it into this whole citizen science project. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is we needed to develop and refine the project support materials. And this is where the students at VIU came into play for their conservation biology class. Um, they helped design the protocols with input from Sarah Dudas, uh, the data forms, educational resources, and then it's been highlighted in many, many areas in the citizen science literature that these need to be tested over and over and over again. They need to be high quality, they need to be simple, they need to have function, and they need to be um, a bit flexible for your audience. So we did our first pilot of the, we, we thought it was going to be a pilot of the protocols, uh, but it ended up being a pilot of the whole program, which actually worked out really well. So in the fall of 2014, um, we, put, we worked with Departure Bay Eco School, one single grade five class, and we met them at the school, we walked down to the beach, we had the transects laid out, we had the quadrats laid out, um, bags labeled, ready to go, the students came down, they dug for bivalves, uh, they brought them to a weigh station, an expert who identified them and weighed them, and um, then they went to an education, an education station where they looked at microscopes and they talked to some students about different concepts. Um, so from when we walked away, the, the feedback from everyone was that this was a huge success. Everyone was really happy. If that had all been, we, if that had all we'd offered, everyone would have been fine. Uh, but I come from an event organization background and I feel that debriefing after an event is really essential because it can always be improved. So despite all the, you know, the rainbows and clouds that were being spewed on us, I felt like we should sit down and talk about, because I saw some things that weren't, weren't um, up to par of what I would like to have seen. So we felt that the scientific goals were pretty close to being met. Even though these were grade five students, um, they were collecting relatively accurate data if we had someone monitoring them. Um, there are some problems definitely dealing with uh, younger groups and um, attention spans and what they're capable and what you can trust them with. But those were things that we could work on. We definitely had an educational impact. I mean, the students were engaged, they were outside, it was a gorgeous day. Um, they had their hands dirty, they were finding worms, they were, they were having an excellent time. And it had context, they were out in the environment, um, in the ocean, looking around, and they, we were opening their eyes. But, one of the, but we felt like our educational goals, and this is where I was the dark cloud, because I felt like our educational goals were not being met. The students really weren't involved in the scientific inquiry at all. They arrived, they dug for clams, they had a great time. They didn't, I didn't feel like they learned in depth. They got an overview of sort of the problems of an invasive species and that's about it. We didn't connect it to the formal curriculum at all. Um, the students... Um, you know, they, it was a field trip for them. They didn't go back to class and reflect on what they'd done. They didn't have to do anything before. And I really felt like we didn't give them more of an awareness of what their impact was on that environment, the intertidal ecosystem itself or the ocean in, in general. So we definitely had some goals to improve our, the product that we were producing. 
Um, so recruit and train volunteers, although I'm not going to talk about this a lot because we are lucky we have uh, university students available to us at almost all times of the year. Uh, but I do feel that it's important to note that this is a big part of developing a citizen science project. Um, so that led, lead, led to our beta testing. So we've actually had great news in the last month that the school district in our area, Nanaimo Ladysmith area, has agreed to fund that every single grade five student in the district will be part of the citizen science project. So that was a big step for us. So this is a commitment for one year, possibly up to five, but they could only commit funding for one year. So that led to um, a, bit of, a bit of a panic. We suddenly had 29 schools that we had to pump through the system in, in one school calendar year. So we did a beta testing in June where we took four schools that arrived sequentially and um, we modified our logistics which um, improved, definitely improved the efficiency. We modified our volunteer training, which definitely improved uh, the knowledge transfer between our experts and our students. And uh, we definitely improved the educational experience because we designed a, a research, we had a research guide that would meet a small group of students. So a class of 30 would arrive, we'd split them into six groups, and then they would have a research guide that stayed with them the entire time and they'd be you know, recording the data themselves, they'd be, they'd be placing the transect, and you'd be discussing all the scientific reasoning behind this, and at the same time the biological um, importance of what you were doing, and the students led the conversation. And that just opened up the door, and I, I can't stress how important it was to change the format that we had to let the students lead the research themselves, that they really felt that they were um, a part of it, that what they discovered was going to go towards the project itself. Um, we also tweaked the protocols and some things as simple as our education materials that actually helped, went toward the scientific side of improving our data quality, as well as the research guide improved the data quality because they watched every step of the process. So that was our testing, those are the four schools. Next year we'll be going into um, um, our next steps are to take these 29 students, uh, 29 uh, schools with their grade, all their grade five classes and try and put it through the citizen science project, the research days we call them. Also with my interest in education technology, I feel like one of our next big step is to create an interactive website where we can provide project materials and um, information where we can um, have interaction with the data which I've talked about as being so important um, for that Im immediate engagement to visualize it um, having a newsletter to prolong the interactivity with the project, create competition so that you can have one class pit against another. And then I also feel that it can really um, add to the global connection. So we can maybe invite a classroom in Japan to do the same exact protocols and then compare it from one classroom to the next. So I think the potential with the technology is enormous. We have to start small. We didn't have a lot of funding, but I do believe that um, this can move forward and we do have a set amount of money to move forward. I also feel that the teacher professional development is a really, really essential part of this because those students, whether they're engaged or not, if that door closes the minute that you walk away, um, you, you've only done what you can. I, I really feel it's important to educate the, um, the teachers. And because of the changes in curriculum that are coming or that have changed depending on what province you're in, um, those teachers are looking for a way to include inquiry-based learning into their classroom. So I think that's super essential. Um, a data plan is something that we haven't worked on yet that's going to have to come to terms pretty quickly that this is a major component of it. And as a couple of you have spoken about this morning, measuring the impacts. How is this changing these students and these teachers' perception of the ocean in their, in their, in their world? How are they impacting it? What can they do? Um, so that's my interest with uh, education research background is that I really want to examine this a lot closer once the project moves forward. So if you have any questions at all about implementing a citizen science project, the background, or um, trials and tribulations, definitely uh, see me after. Thank you.